Well, thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, dear Ilmas, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to speak here today. It's a pleasure for me, and I congratulate you also uh, for this uh, conference on a very topical issue. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, Latvia is the latest member of our European and Monetary Union. But in a sense, I do believe that Latvia's capital could also be considered part of the vanguard. The history of European integration has been a process of back and forth, marked by spectacular advances and equally huge setbacks. However, when we did witness progress on the road to integration, more often than not, it was driven by one single factor, which was trade. And when it comes to trade, driving integration in Europe, one early example immediately springs to mind, and this is, of course, the Hanseatic League. Prior to the foundation of the League, trade in the Baltic Sea was for the adventurers only. Raids and piracy made it risky, and the scale of international trade in the Baltic area remained insignificant. The growth of the Hanseatic League changed that. From the 13th, 13th to the 17th century, stretching from the Baltic to the North Sea, the League protected trade routes and sheltered its members from tariff and custom restrictions. And as a result, trade soared and with it the wealth of the members of the League. The Hanseatic cities had their own legal system and they maintained their own armies for mutual protection and aid. But the League did not constitute a federation quite similar to the Euro area today. Riga's membership in the League date, dates back to 1282. So when it comes to taking an active role in European integration, Latvia is a clear leader, not a laggard. Unfortunately, the economic association of which Latvia is now a member does not seem to be leading in terms of economic growth. So the questions are, what will it take to change that? What reforms are needed? to spur sustainable growth and enhance stability? What are the respective roles of monetary, fiscal, and structural policy in this context? And in the next 20 minutes, I want to lay out my perspective on these questions, and partly I think they have, to be, have been answered already by the previous speakers. But first, let us have a look at where the euro area stands at the current juncture. Euro area GDP is still 2.4% below its pre-crisis level, and growth stalled in the second quarter of this year. The biggest three economies, Germany, France, and Italy, did not provide any growth impetus, with Germany and Italy contracting by 0.2% and France economy stagnating. Although the decline of German GDP in the second quarter must be seen in the context of the strong increase in the first quarter due to the, measured by our standards, mild winter weather, indicators for the euro area suggest that growth will pick up only at a very moderate pace. And this is also confirmed by the latest data, notably in Germany, which have been rather disappointing. In sync with the subdued pace of the recovery, inflation in the euro area has been low as well. Still, the risk of becoming enmeshed in a deflationary scenario is considered to be low, and I think in this respect we share a common view in the Governing Council. Rather than fearing broad-based deflation, the Governing Council is more concerned about a too prolonged period of low inflation. But so far, the low inflationary pressure for a large part is due to the decline in energy prices and the necessary adjustment processes that have been talked about already in some euro area countries. Factors beyond the direct influence of the euro system's monetary policy and factors to which monetary policy should react, simply speaking, only in the case of second round effects. Monetary policy in the euro area then is facing difficult times especially as it has clearly reached the lower bound of its conventional instruments, which are the interest rates. Further accommodation can therefore happen only through unconventional measures. And unconventional measures are what the Governing Council decided on its June 
and September meetings with the launch of targeted long-term refinancing operations and two asset purchase programs, the details of which were presented two weeks ago. The asset purchase programs have triggered a debate as their justification insinuates a shift from programs specifically aimed at credit easings, easing towards a philosophy more oriented towards quantitative easing. But what, one should also be in mind that even before these decisions, the monetary policy stance in the euro area was already very accommodative. The governing council therefore has to judge whether additional stimulus is needed or whether it is effective and what unintended side effects would come with these measures. The declared goal of expanding the balance sheet of the euro system poses challenges for another reason too. Purchases of asset-backed securities are problematic when they imply a transfer of risk from banks to the balance sheet of the central bank. And in the end, this would, could amount to a transfer of risk from banks to the taxpayer, which would run counter to everything we have strived to achieve in banking regulation over the last years. Thus, the higher the target for the expansion of the euro system's balance sheet, the higher the risk of overpaying for the assets that are eligible. And thus, the pricing mechanism that is currently being debated and will be determined soon needs to, be, needs to pay special attention to these issues. In any case, monetary policy accommodation can only do so much. And the longer it stays expansionary, the higher could be the corresponding risk to financial stability. What monetary accommodation definitely cannot do is to tackle the root causes of the low growth potential in the euro area, the structural barriers that hamper competition, innovation, and hence productivity. Addressing these structural deficiencies would also go a long way towards improving the transmission of monetary policy impulses. In many member states, particularly in those worst hit by the crisis, substantial efforts have already been made towards that end. In order to unleash productivity, labor markets have become more flexible and competition in goods and services has become more intense. And according to the World Bank's Doing Business report, which has been already mentioned, the efforts are starting to pay off. Portugal, Italy, and Spain have climbed up the ranking ladder by 17, 13, and 10 point positions respectively over the last four years. Greece has moved up by 37 positions. But it is obvious that ample room remains for further improvements while Portugal, Spain, and Italy, and Greece have moved up the ladder in the Doing Business report. They are still a consider considerable distance from the top with Portugal ranking 31st, Spain 52nd, Italy 65th, and Greece 72nd. Accordingly, recent estimates by the European Commission suggest a medium-term growth potential over the period 2014 to 2023 for the euro area of only 1%. So the potential gains from structural reforms remain especially large. A study by economists from the OECD suggests that a comprehensive package of labor, product, tax, and pension reforms could raise GDP per capita in the EU by about 11% after 10 years. For the US, the potential GDP increase of structural reforms is 5%, so much less than less than half of that in the EU. By no means are gains to be reaped in the peripheral countries only. Ranked 111th in the World Bank doing business category ease of starting business, for instance, Germany has ample room for improvements as well. And this holds also for other economic policy areas where reforms have even been rolled back over the recent times. By the same token, growth enhancing reforms are not confined to the national level only. A lot of the potential inherent in our most important catalyst for growth, which is the single market, is still untapped. The single market has been very successful in facilitating trade in goods. Hence, competition in this area is quite intense. The markups that firms are able to charge in addition to their costs due to market power are low and are quite comparable to those in the US, for example. 
When it comes to services, however, the picture looks different. Markups are higher on average than in the US, and it is probably safe to say that the service directive has fallen short of expectations. Completing the single market for services therefore holds the promise of substantial economic gains. This could be achieved by finally establishing the country of origin principle, as is already the case in the common market for goods. This principle states that a firm should no longer be hampered by regulation in the importing country if it has already complied with the national regulation in its home country. The same goes for bringing the single market into the digital age. When it comes to the digital economy, fragmentations still abound, in particular with respect to legal issues such as privacy and data protection, content and copyright, liability of online intermediaries, e-payments, and electronic contracts. The EU is still comprised of 28 individual digital markets rather than one digital market. And this is holding back innovation, growth, and ultimately jobs. Studies suggest that establishing a harmonized and well-regulated digital single market holds the same potential as the introduction of the original one, raising GDP by as much as 4%. And in Germany, for example, this could imply an additional more than 400,000 jobs over the period 2015 to 2020. <clears throat> Some steps have already been taken towards a true single market for the digital economy, but we are, of course, not there yet. Continuing along this path to the end, to this end would provide a major boost to European competitiveness, and it is therefore more than worth the effort. Another push to EU GDP could potentially stem from an EU-US trade agreement. The US is the EU's biggest export market and its first most important partner for trade in goods. The ties between the two regions are even closer in terms of service trade. Given the low average tariff rates, non-tariff barriers are probably the greatest still existing impediment to bilateral trade. So in the first round, the effects on trade and GDP, however, would be level effects, and it is only through the increased competition that growth could follow. Furthermore, many aspects of the deal are still highly controversial, and the Co European Commission now hopes to reach an agreement only within a couple of years. Ladies and gentlemen, an increase in investment is a precondition for higher growth rates. Durable growth rates thus require reforms that cut red tape, spur innovation, and make labor costs more calculable. And this is not only conducive to a higher potential in the future, it acts also as a near-term stimulus in its own right. Investment is not only tomorrow's supply, it's also today's demand. So how does public investment come into the equation? Various commentators have called on euro area countries with perceived fiscal space, I guess they mean Germany without saying it, to seize the opportunity to present, present it by lower interest rates and increase investment. Olivier Blanchard, the IMF's chief economist, has argued that this would also help the euro area periphery. He argues that in the current situation, spillover effects could be particularly high due to the monetary policy being constrained by the lower bound on interest rates and the prevalence of liquidity constrained households. But even if this were the case, the peripheries share of German imports is very low, which suggests that spillovers would remain very modest in this area, all the more as the import content of public investment is especially small. The boost to the peripheral countries from an increase in German public investment is therefore likely to be rather not significant. What is more, the argument that Germany should seize the opportunity of low interest rates does not hold up to close, closer scrutiny either. Debt totaling uh, at more than two trillion euros and the huge demographic burden Germany faces in the coming years will wait on its growth and public finances. And in that light, pursuing a balanced budget makes perfect sense 
for the country. And with the economy operating at normal capacity utilization, Germany is not in need for fiscal stimulus either. And this will even remain the case with the revised forecast that still foresee growth in line with potential. On the contrary, in the face of coming demographic challenges, costly stimulus measures could even backfire via negative confidence effects. So is the case for, for higher investment completely without merit? And of course, it is not. Arguments in favor should not stem from cyclical considerations. They should stem from structural considerations. Where Germany's growth potential is concerned, there is agreement that higher public investment does have a role to play. With regard to the size of the investment gap, however, there is probably less agreement. It is important that all investment measures are judged on a case-by-case -case basis, as we have seen in the past that not all public investment measures have been money well spent. And we should focus on shifting priorities in public expenditures. So rather than talking about debt finance fiscal stimulus, I would say we should more focus on a structural shift of government expenditures from consumption to investment. Reforming the financial arrangements between the federal, the state, and the municipality level could encourage that shift. Somewhat more autonomy with regard to revenues might alleviate the problem of lacking funds to some extent. At the same time, however, it has to be ensured that the overall tax burden is not increasing. Ladies and gentlemen, the reforms laid out so far, together with other widely discussed structural measures and sound public finances, would allow the euro area economy to shift gears and accelerate. But they do not in themselves guarantee that the engine will run more smoothly and reliably. And this is where reforms addressing the euro area's institutional architecture come in. The euro area teams up one common monetary policy with 18 national fiscal and economic policies. And this approach reflects a currency area composed of sovereign member states. It grants member states sufficient leeway to preserve their diversity, that is to establish their own business models or to tailor institutions and policies to their own national preferences. At the same time, at the same time it leaves the consequences of such, such decisions with the respective member state and consistently rules out the option of mutualizing public debt with other euro area member states. But this setup also creates vulnerabilities. First, a combination of this kind gives rise to a deficit bias as it allows the cost of fiscal imprudence to be shifted on partially to others. An unsustainable fiscal situation in one country has repercussions of, as we have seen in the crisis for the monetary union as a whole. And to some extent you could compare that to what ex economists call the tragedy of the commons just as overfishing creates negative externalities for other countries, excessive public debt harms the euro area as a whole. Excessive debt in one member state drives up longer term interest rates for all euro area countries. And second, each member state issues debt in a currency that it cannot create. Thus, a high level of fiscal discipline is needed to ensure that solvency concerns do not spiral out of control. But the precautions taken in the Maastricht Treaty to ensure sound public finances have proven insufficient. The rules of the Stability and Growth Pact have been broken numerous times in the past, not least by Germany, France, and Italy. And the Nobelot Clause failed to exert the expected disciplining effect on governments in the run-up to the crisis, as markets did not take sufficient account of the different macroeconomic developments in the respective countries. The rescue packages provided to countries which lost market access did help to prevent the crisis from escalating. But at the same time, they've thrown the balance between liability and control out of kilter. While spending decisions essentially remained a national prerogative, liability has been partially mutualized. So what is to be done? Some necessary steps have already been taken. The fiscal rules have been stiffened with greater automaticity in the Stability and Growth Pact and the introduction of the Fiscal Compact. 
However, as we have learned from the crisis, rules can only be a first line of defense, and also they have to be applied to fulfill their purpose. Thus, the current debate in Italy and France about their fiscal stance is not really reassuring. But this underscores the need to betray the rules with functioning market discipline. Sound public finances will only be achieved if we rigorously set about restoring the balance between liability and control. One way to do this would be a genuine fiscal union. If common debt were matched by common decision-making, common control, incentives would be aligned again. But this would require a quantum leap in terms of ceding sovereignty to the European level, a leap that at this juncture neither the electorates nor the governments seem to be willing to take. So the true fiscal union that requires extensive changes to the European treaties and to a lot of national constitutions is not in the cards, then we need to take the second avenue. And this avenue implies enhancing the original Maastricht framework that is based on the principle of individual responsibility. The principle requires that sovereigns, banks, and investors bear the consequences of their decisions. The banking union is a very important step in that direction. But also we need to make sure that sovereign debt restructuring is possible without bringing down the entire financial system. To that end, more than three years ago, the Bundesbank proposed automatically extending government bond maturities by, say, three years if the member state is granted, granted financial support from the European Stability Mechanism. This would help to figure out if a country's problems are one of illiquidity or insolvency. Additionally, doing away with the preferential treatment of sovereign debt in banks' balance sheets is of the essence in this respect. The current regulatory framework permits preferential treatment of sovereign exposure in various forms, while bank exposures to a single counterparty are limited in principle to a quarter of their eligible capital. Exposures to sovereigns are exempted from that large exposure regime. Thus, many European banks hold bond bonds from one sovereign only, their home country. But a high level of undiversified sovereign exposure is, of course, what makes sovereign default a potentially systemic event. And for this reason, the large exposure regime needs to apply to sovereigns as well. Moreover, sovereign exposure is privileged by low or zero capital requirements. An adequate risk weighting of sovereign bonds would make banks more resilient if the fiscal position of the respective sovereign were to deteriorate. And it would bring spreads more into line with the underlying risk, thus sending a disciplining signal to the sovereign. If additional capital requirements for European banks were imposed to cover sovereign exposures, the additional capital would be rather small on aggregate, albeit with substantial differences between the banks. The inclusion of sovereigns in the large exposure regime might lead to more substantial repercussions. But these would be manageable if introduced over a transition period, which without question would have to be granted. Ladies and gentlemen, let me come to a close. The biggest bottleneck for growth in the euro area is certainly not monetary policy, nor is it the lack of fiscal stimulus at this juncture. It is structural barriers that impede competition, innovation, and productivity. If these barriers were torn down by all euro area countries, the growth outlook would shift sizably, and this would instantly give rise to higher investment. Complementary reforms on the European level aimed at the services sector could provide a further boost. Taken together, these measures are expected to lift growth by as much as 15% above the current baseline level after 10 years. To me, that sounds like a goal worth expanding some political capital to achieve, as do efforts to bring liability and control back into balance. The resolve the Latvian government showed in securing the joining of the euro has set a shining example in that regard. An example that reminds us of the collective efforts more than 750 years ago, and an example that can serve as a lodestar for the challenges today.
Thank you very much.